that's uh, my introduction. Thank you. My name is Heather Lauer, and I work for the Naval Research Laboratory. Um, I hope you guys can see me. Uh, don't think they were pretty prepared for as short as I am. Um, um, also, I, uh, this talk is uh, completely different than most of what you've heard today. Uh, and I had the challenge, since we had such a great lunch, to keep you guys awake. So I hope I do a good job of that. Um, so today I'm going to talk about fueling um, combustion engines from seawater. Okay, so as I said before, I work for the Naval Research Laboratory. I am a research chemist there, and I'm going to dance around here and try to find the best place to talk to. Um, and essentially, what I like to call this program is really making designer fuels from seawater. And you'll see later how we can change the chemistry, and that's why I am a chemist, to get different products um, from our uh, resources from seawater. And uh, when I talk about this program here, um, Designer Fuel from Seawater is just one of several programs at, at the Naval Research that's dealing with um, uh, creating energy for power and energy for force mobility for the Navy. So I'm not the only one here. Um, and you can see this long list here. Um, so first I'm going to start out with talking about the process, what we're trying to do, and just give you an overview and hopefully get questions later with a little more detail. But uh, fuels from seawater, so you think, well, how, what are they doing, how are they doing this, and why are we getting this out of seawater? Well, first what I'm going to talk about is our step one process. We're going to get CO2 and hydrogen from seawater. And you're thinking, uh, CO2 from seawater, don't you get it from the air? So I'll go through some of the chemistry and why it makes sense from a Navy perspective to get CO2 from seawater. So what happens is I'm going to also explain to you uh, the technology that we're using and that we developed here at NRL, and it's a patented technology, to actually get both CO2 and hydrogen from seawater. And then secondly, once we have these feedstocks, how are we going to chemically convert them into something useful, a designer type fuel like methanol, uh, or olefins, chemicals, and a jet fuel fraction. Now secondly, so I'll introduce you to some of the catalytic conversion technology we're working on and how we're proposing to integrate them and scale it up. And thirdly, we'll talk about scaling and integration of these technologies. And remember, this is a Navy niche. This is something, when we think about our technologies, we're thinking of how do we put this at sea for the Navy. So we're thinking of size, we're thinking of uh, shape, and we're thinking of footprint. How can we get this as small as we physically can so it would be potentially be deployed out at sea? So why would we want to make fuel at sea? Well, once we're successful at this, we could do, this would allow the Navy to produce fuel when and where it's needed. And what that translates to for the Navy is freedom of action. We don't have to worry about foreign sources of oil, and we don't have to worry about the fluctuating prices that we're dealing with. So what are our scientific challenges? Well, we got to capture large enough quantities of carbon dioxide and hydrogen from seawater, and we got to do it fast, and we got to do it efficiently. And there are no technologies out there right now that do that, except for what we've designed and developed at NRL. Secondly, how do we get the high catalytic conversion of CO2 and hydrogen to a usable fuel? I'm not sure if people are familiar with, we talked about a lot of people making natural gas, um, and using natural gas in uh, our society to power and energy. We can also take the natural gas and, and turn it into syngas, which is CO and hydrogen, and effectively get that to a liquid fuel. But what I'm proposing to do is carbon dioxide, which is a much more stable, uh, less energetic molecule. So why are we going to capture CO2 from seawater? Well, we're the Navy. We're out at sea. Well, and if you look, the total CO2 content in seawater is 140 times more concentrated than it is in air on a weight per volume basis. So it's about 100 milligrams per liter of CO2s in seawater versus 0.7 milligrams per liter in air. Okay? So if we look here, uh, there's so much more carbon in uh, seawater than is in the air. And so how is the CO2 present in seawater and how are we going to, why is our technology so uh, revolutionary for doing this? Well CO2 is in the air but it's in equilibrium with seawater and what it does is it gets hydrated by one mole of water, I'm not going to talk too much about this because your eyes are going to start rolling back in your head, but you get carbonic acid and then that carbonic acid 
it's in equilibrium with carbonate and bicarbonate. So how you guys are familiar with bicarbonate and carbonate, I have to change that equilibrium of the bicarbonate and carbonate to push it to CO2. So that's why this technology is revolutionary. I'm not just getting the dissolved CO2 in seawater, I'm getting it all bound as carbonate and bicarbonate. So let's talk about our carbon capture approach, what we've done at NRL and what we've patented to do this. We started out at NRL with a concept to get this out of uh, seawater. And so what we did was we took these uh, modular configurations that were used to um, get chlorine dioxide, the chlorine dioxide electrochemical cells, and we reconfigured them for our application. And this particular module only processed about 140 milliliters per minute of seawater. And what we were able to do is, is, is show that we were able to change the pH of the seawater so that we could get pull it all, all the carbonate out as CO2, which I'm not going to show too many equations. Then what we were able to do is actually scale this cell up from producing, processing 140 mils a minute of seawater to processing 1,900 mils a minute of seawater. And then we put it on an independent mobile skid down at our Key West facility. And this is where it sits. Um, this is a nice facility. And why are we doing this at Key West? Well, Key West, for NRL, we have a big corrosion center down there that we do a lot of testing. And this seawater, the average pH and salinity, represents that of the entire uh, world's oceans. So it's beautiful, it's pristine, it's untouched seawater. And so this, um, this device sits down there at Key West for, as a demonstration piece. And you can see this cell, the arrow points, points right to the cell. So it's a small fraction of what's supporting this cell. And the reason that we have this skin around it is because we didn't have all the pieces and parts down there. It's a corrosion facility. To, to, to run these experiments. And um, this cell needs a portion of fresh water. So we actually, on this skid, generated our own fresh water for the, for the cell. So this just gives you an outline of, of what we're producing. Now this skid uh, can produce up to enough CO2 to make about 40 to 100 milliliters per day of fuel. So not very much. So you can see where we need to sc uh, scale. But the great thing about this particular cell is that it's scaled up linearly, and we can also produce hydrogen at the same time in our cathode compartment of this cell. So this system not only gives us CO2, it gives us hydrogen. Well, we were very excited from that standpoint, because now I don't have to buy electrolysis equipment, expensive electrolysis equipment, which is large and bulky. So when I'm thinking of designing things for the Navy, I've got to make it as small a footprint as possible. So now I've got a two for one here. So what have we learned from this device? Well, first of all, I'm not sure if any of you in the room are familiar with TRL levels, and that's what we define our technologies at, at the Navy. And we've taken this technology really from a TRL level three, which is a bench scale laboratory system, up to a TRL level six, where we've actually built it and demonstrated it in a live marine environment. So very excited about that. And we've operated it on and off for over a month. And this system, we put it, we deployed it down to Key West in, uh, I think it was like 2011. And the wonderful thing about it, people ask us, how's it doing? Well, if you see this picture here, it's not very detailed, but it, it, it's exposed to the elements because it's just sitting under a shed. And every time we go down there, this is made with commercial off-the-shelf pieces, she starts right up. And the cell's done fantastic. It's got a variations of uh, membranes in there, and we've never had any issues with uh, fouling of the membranes or of the actual cells. So we're very excited about that. Um, we've been able to use this skid in a live environment to learn a lot about seawater, learn a lot about how it's going to operate in our system, and how to um, generate longevity with it. I, I have here polarity reversal, and it's hard to kind of go into, but I can describe a little bit about polarity reversal in just a second. Well, what we've been able to achieve is that we can get 92% of all the CO2 out of the seawater um, in the form of carbonate and bicarbonate, from the carbonate and bicarbonate. But we have to do this at a pH of less than 4.5. So just to show you a little bit of data and the type of research that we've done, this is pH driven. You can see over here, if I have carbon dioxide versus pH, I have to get down to pH of 4.5 or less. And then I can pull all the CO2 out of the seawater, or 92% of it. Well, we were able to, um, to take this cell and, and do several different renditions on it. 
actually, when I say rendition, do new designs from everything that we learned down there since 2011. In the first system, you could see the cell operating, but it takes a long time to get down to pH of 4.5. It takes like 25 minutes. Well, how, how can you possibly scale that and make that a reasonable system to put on a ship? Now, who's going to do that? And then at 50 minutes, I have to change the polarity in the cell because I've got all this precipitation out on my cathode. So here I'm, I'm just pretty much, I, I won't use a technical term for that. We're, we're SOL, <laughs> per se. I and mean, this is going nowhere. This bright idea, what are we going to do? So, and, and we've got to change the polarity reversal because the, the resistance builds up in the cell. We're not getting good power, too much power to the cell and we can't operate that way. Well, by the third rendition here, we've gotten this down to about 10 minutes of e equilibration time once we've changed the polarity, and we can start pulling now the CO2. And so what that means and from a design perspective is you can have a couple different cells, one equilibrating for like five or 10 minutes, and then the other one operating for you, and they can cycle through. And they do this, this particular technology is, this electrochemical technology is used for desalination. Um, it's based on that uh, type of uh, process. So these modules actually have been scaled up and used for that. What we've done is we've designed the innards differently to do the application that we want to do. Uh, there's no energy penalty here for carbon dioxide because this cell has also been designed to get hydrogen. It's based on Faraday's law, how much current we have to put in. So we put current in, we lower the uh, pH, but we're also producing hydrogen simultaneously. And we can produce it in the amount needed to make a fuel fraction. Um, so where do we want to go with this technology? Where's the money needed to transition this and to go further? Well, we'd like to scale it up uh, to running two cells, and we'd like to be able to process at least three gallons uh, a minute. And what we also want to do is make the cell, we initially designed this to get CO2 and also hydrogen, but it's not efficient for hydrogen. It takes two, the energy penalty and the resistance in the cell won't allow us to do that as energy efficiently as we like. So that's where we want to put our research focus and, and get the cell energy efficient for that. That takes money and time. So what are the pros to this issue? You ask, okay, why would we want to do this? Well, there's no chemicals. I don't have to ever add any chemicals to this electrochemical process. It's all done with electricity and exchanging uh, the word hydrogen and protons and ions and et cetera. So I don't have to add any chemicals. Um, there's no additional equipment needed for hydrogen. Of course, I said that's our energy penalty there um, and, our, and, the, and the thing that we'd like to make the cell more efficient. Now, what's the cons? Well, you scratch your head and you say, i got to move a swimming pool. I actually have to move a swimming pool amount of water to get all the carbon and hydrogen I need to make a gallon of fuel. And everybody's like, oh, that's, that's no. But the technology's there, right? I mean, we've got pumps. We have uh, particular ways to do this. And the alternative would be, if I wanted to do this at sea, was would be to move 3.2 million gallons of air. So that's not conceivable, and the technology to do that would be too big from a, a standpoint of a footprint. All right, so now I've talked a lot about CO2 and hydrogen and the, uh, and the patented technology that we've developed at NRL. And let's go into fuel synthesis. And is everybody uh, who's not chemists here? I'm trying to make this painless as possible. So now I've got my CO2 and hydrogen, and the, the fantastic thing about it is I could just, do, I have a catalytic process, and I just change, oh, I'm going to talk about a little bit of chemistry here with the periodic table. I change the transition metal. So what I can do by changing the transition metal ion in my catalyst is I can make methane. I can make, I can do the reverse water gas shift. I can get syngas. I can also make methanol or olefins or chemicals. So this is a, does, it's a synthesis process. So I can design the fuel how I want to do this just by tailoring the metal catalyst. So once I have made, for example, methanol, or I've made um, olefins, for example, and olefins are just saturated hydrocarbons with a double bond. And so what I have to, I have to take, so for example, if I have um, propanol, which is CH, what, CH3H6, the double bond, I gotta click them together. So I can make a, a hydrocarbon fraction that's C9 to C16, because that's what jet fuel is. So if I wanna make jet fuel at C, I gotta get to C9. 
And the way I'm going to do this is through an oligomerization reaction. And so I need a second catalyst to do this. So I got the first one that initially takes my CO2 and hydrogen to like olefins or methanol. And then I need a second process to get it to a jet fuel fraction that's usable for the Navy. So let's just give you an idea of what we've been able to accomplish in the lab. Um, so I start out here showing you a GC mass spec total ion chromatogram. And you're thinking, what, what, what is that? Well, basically what it does is it, you put the fuel in, it separates out the fuel, and it gives you the hydrocarbon numbers and, the, and its range, okay? This total ion mass spec here. And what this does is it shows you that this fuel is primarily made up of C10 to C15 hydrocarbons, right? Then that C9 to C16 range. And this petroleum-derived JP5, what it does is it meets all military specifications. And this is very important. The Navy has to have their fuel meet a specification. Because if it doesn't, you're not buying it. And because they don't want it in their engine and they don't want their ship to stop out in the middle of the ocean or their plane to fall out of the sky. So it's got to meet specification. Well, I'm sure we didn't talk a whole lot today um, on biomass. Well, the Navy's been had this big push to get fuels derived from algae or camelina. So the, the camelina does the JP5, makes JP5, and JP5, I didn't tell you, is the Navy's jet fuel. That's what they use to fly their planes. And the algae is used to make their F-76, which is the diesel to power their, uh, their, their ships, right? So this is a camelina-derived JP5, jet fuel, okay? Well, you look at it, and from the total ion chromatogram, it doesn't look anything like this. It, but it does have a similar range. If I look here and I highlight the, their hydrocarbon range for, based on the ion uh, chromatogram and their time coming out of the instrument, they line up, but they don't look anything alike. So it's kind of puzzling. Here I can have two different types of fuel that don't look anything alike, but they meet the mill specification, which is good for us from a synthesis standpoint, right? Um, so we, we should be able to meet this. So let's look at what we've got coming out of our system. And this is with an iron catalyst. Our total iron chromatogram shows that yes, we are in the right region. Yes, we've met the hydrocarbon region. We have some low ends here, and we have some high ends, but there is distillation. We can distillate those out, and we actually have done that, and get in the region that we need for a jet fuel fraction. And this also shows what happens from our oligomerization reaction. We have a lot of light ends. And also, with the, depending on the different catalysts we use, we get a different hydrocarbon fraction. And yes, we're able to uh, distill, distill this out to produce the jet fuel fraction that we need. And that technology and that chemistry is well known. So we're very excited. Now, we have not put our fuel through the mill specification. We're just, uh, we actually haven't done that at this point because we need to scale up and make quantities where we can do that type of testing. Um, so we're not going to say that we can meet that mill specification, but what we can say, and this is actually liquid fuel that we've, that's come out of our system, what we can say is we can run an internal combustion engine. And we did this, we were very excited, we took a little model airplane, because we're the Navy, and we didn't have a whole lot of money, so we did this on the cheap, right? <laughs> Bunch of chemists got out there, my uh, colleague looking like Snoopy, um, and, and he did, it was a riot. Thing back in the back. It was the, probably it was the first day of spring. It was the coldest day imaginable, but we were excited. And we took this uh, cute little model airplane that came with everything for like $600. Cheap, 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 right? <laughs> and uh, on March 22nd, we were able to put our fuel in it and demonstrated it, and it, we were able to put it around, uh, you know, put, you know, have it on the ground because in DC you can't. Um, lifted off the ground due to the air regulations <laughs> and it's next to the Potomac River so we were like please you know right up in and you could see us going off but we were very excited got the propeller going and uh, very very happy and actually um, we had a little bit more money later on and we got some of our folks uh, who do all these model airplanes and things that I can't talk about uh, look at our plane and test it with our uh, fuel and they found out that we have quite a bit more torque than what's typically used for the fuel in this engine and they're going to fly it next week we're scheduled to actually lift this off the ground and do a video of it flying through the air so we're like oh, super excited and then we have somebody that's gonna that knows what they're doing flying the plane because apparently that's not pretty if 
you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> we, we knew enough to be dangerous and, you know, ride it on the ground, but not, you know, we didn't try to fly it. So that's, that's where we are with the fuel generation. So production at sea. So we're kind of doing this backwards. We're talking about our research, our process. Now let's look at some of the Navy's issues, because we want to do this for the Navy, right? So what, how, what, how do we propose to make this at sea, and why is this important? Well, if, uh, in, we consider in fuel, synthetic fuel production, a game-changing proposition, because it means we're not dependent on foreign sources. We have freedom of action, um, and we don't have to deal with these price fluctuations. If you look over here, I've been able to, to get the data out um, that shows um, what the Navy's paid for fuel over um, uh, since 2000. And you can see back in 2000, we paid 63 uh, cents a gallon for jet fuel. And now we're paying up over, what, $3.75 according to the Defense Logistics Agency. And what's important about this is that the Navy makes decisions today for 20 years from now. And, it's, and so we're stuck. We have our fuel ships. At one time, it was not economical to use nuclear uh, ships because of uh, the cost of fuel. And you can see that down here at 63 cents a gallon. But now as fuel is rising, this idea that it's running out, possibly for the Navy going this particular way to make their own fuel and looking at more nuclear options would be a, you know, advantageous. But I, I, I can only suggest technology. I can't tell people what to do. <laughs> um, so in FY12, our fuel bill for the Navy, we purchased over 600 million gallons of fuel, okay? And, and it was delivered to Navy vessels <coughs> on the way. And this 600 million gallons it it's composes of F-76 and JP-5. So we've got flyer planes and we got to um, steam our ships. But this $3.75 does not constitute what we actually pay for the fuel. And according to the Defense Science Board, it's about over $7 a gallon to deliver this at sea. So we've got this issue. And then if you're a Marine and you've got to get fuel deep into the battle space, that could be anywhere, oh, that could be over $100 a gallon. So you can see the cost here associated with um, just with the fuel alone. And I have a type 12. No, I'm type okay, so we also have over uh, 30 fleet replenishment oils that go oilers that go out to our ships at sea and deliver our fuel. Now, one of the things that we have to remember is you're never going to entirely get rid of these people, even if we make fuel at sea, because we need food and we need clothes, we need weapons, and we need supplies. So these guys are not going to be totally taken off of the table. But still, if you can imagine if our enemy had making fuel in place and they can continue to fight and we have an oiler coming in, you can see some of the issues that we have from a logistics standpoint for fighting. So this just breaks up the fuel and shows what's going on in the Navy. And, and we've pulled these numbers out and we were kind of fascinated. The Navy buys different jet fuel than, for example, the Air Force or our commercial planes because of the flashpoint. It's got to be... Uh, it's got to be a different flashpoint because you don't want it to catch fire on a deck. So when it spills, the flashpoint has to be at a, it has to be higher. So you don't want it to um, catch on fire as easy, for example, with JP-8. And in fact, if they get JP-8, uh, they'll dispose of it many times because of the flashpoint issue. So what we were interested in found out just looking in um, some of what was actually delivered from the Military Sea Systems Command is that we use quite a bit of JP-5 on land. And we couldn't figure out why. We still don't have an answer to that question. And this is actually how much, only 33%, is delivered to sea. And now of F-76 of the 500 million gallons per year that we, we purchase and, and have, <coughs> most of it's delivered to sea. Now what we were excited about is if we just wanted to make jet fuel, now that only 33% goes, hey, this is pretty easy. We could, probably, we could tackle this problem. We'd only need roughly five nuclear ships to make all the jet fuel needed at sea. But one of the things that's interesting to note is that everything, uh, all the engines in the Navy are certified to run on JP-5. So we could just use one fuel. We don't have to have F-76 and we don't have to have JP-5. So once we learned this, that hey, I only got to make 33% of the jet fuel, that might be conceivable make, to make all of the Navy's fuel at sea. So that was very exciting, and make one fuel. But of course, this is a synthesis process. I can technically make two different fuels, but if I wanted it to be easier, I'd go with JP-5. Just makes better sense. 
Okay, so how would we do this? Well, we envision maybe make, having a lily pad so an oiler could come up, take the fuel off the lily pad and take it out to the strike group. Or you could think of actually having a fuel ship, turning one of these oilers into a fuel ship or making a, a commissioning your own type of ship to, to make fuel at sea. So again, you make fuel at the point of use when you need it. You're not dependent on expensive fossil fuels from other countries. You don't have these long logistics tails. We go into a port, we pick up the fuel, everybody knows where we are. Okay, so that's, it, it's very exciting from a standpoint. Plus, what we're proposing is CO2 neutral. We're getting CO2 out of seawater. It re equilibrates with the CO2 in the air and we burn it. So it's neutral. So from an environmental standpoint, the Navy should be very happy, right? We're not creating any more CO2. Okay, so what do we propose to do? What is our long-term plan? Well, right now we have this nice skid at Key West that we've worked on. And in fact, I uh, have a reservist, Navy Reserve Officer, that's helping me and working on this program. And he's at Key West right now running a different cell. And the cell that I described to you today gets CO2 and hydrogen from seawater. But we also have a technology, um, a certain cell with a different design that just targets CO2 and making that more efficient in case uh, uh, we have another source of hydrogen that people seem to be very excited about from these thorium reactors and uh, splitting water at particular temperatures. So now what we're working on is scaling up our catalyst process to get it from a TR level three, which is the bench scale, up to something scalable and uh, on, a, on a skid. And then we've, we see the technology, depending on funding, moving in a forward direction that could potentially be ready to be deployed shipbound, say in 2021. So we've talked a lot about uh, production at fuel and uh, CO2, and everybody asks me, how are you going to possibly do this? <laughs> because let's face it, my energy penalty really is getting hydrogen. And hydrogen, if I'm spending all this energy to get hydrogen, what happens is I've got to put 60, I'm only going to get 60% of the energy out as a liquid fuel. But we, you're never going to fly an aircraft on hydrogen. You're not going to fly an aircraft on seawater. So you have to have a liquid fuel, right? So, so do I, am I concerned that there's an energy penalty? People, people beat us up over that. And I'm not going to lie, there is one. But if we have a different type of reactor technology and we can use higher temperatures to split water and we have alternatives to make this hydrogen, then that penalty will go away. We've also looked at um, uh, OTEC. We've had folks from Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion <coughs> interested because they're moving the types of waters that we're talking about. And they're making, uh, uh, and, uh, what is it from, it's essentially a solar process, right? You're taking the uh, temperature differentiation in the ocean to turn a turbine to make electricity. So they said, hey, why make electricity and try to tether it back to land? Let's make fuel. But OTEC is still a ways out, right, from uh, its infancy and development. Then the other is these uh, wave buoys. They're telling me they're going to put 100 megawatts off the coast of um, Oregon. I've been told by a lot of people this is rubbish because there's too many moving parts and this technology is not necessarily feasible. I, I don't know. That's not my area of expertise, but we are trying to come up with alternatives because if we have windmills or alternative energy sources, who cares if, we're, uh, if I need too much energy to get hydrogen <coughs> if it's coming from natural alternative sources? So let's go with a summary. This is going to be a shorter talk, and I hope I get lots and lots of questions. Um, NRL, we're developing the technologies to get CO2 and hydrogen from seawater, and we're developing uh, the technologies to make designer fuels. I've had people come to me and say, can you make uh, uh, methane? Yes, we can make methane, but that's essentially natural gas, and it's cheap. But if I want to make it at a forward base, well, it's not necessarily cheap to have to bring it there. So. You know, would I use a windmill? Would I use a nuclear reactor? I've, uh, there are folks um, in Europe that are uh, taking their alternative solar energy and splitting water at night to make uh, natural gas and putting the converters on their cars and driving natural gas. So people are thinking about this. They're just not thinking about it in this country because, well, natural gas is cheap and alternative energy sources from coal and natural gas are just it's making it not competitive to do this type of process. Ah, so that's the end of it. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions, 
I'd be happy to take them. Oh, thanks, Heather.